nice as I put us in here and then where are we? There we are. Hi everybody. It's Dr. Linda of the Vascular Birthmarks Foundation. Welcome to our June 2023 VBF Facebook Live with the world-renowned laser expert, Dr. Roy Geronimus. And I was, and say hello to everybody. Hi there. And I think you and I talked about this. I was calculating the other day based on how many years you've been doing this and how many you treat, which is you do the most of anyone we know every month. And I was thinking it's over 30,000 laser treatments you've done. Uh, I've lost track, but yeah. I, do, I trust your judgment. Yeah, and so over 30,000. So who can say that, right? Um, so let us know that you can see us by um, acknowledging it. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting my phone ready right now to see if I can see us on here. Yep, we're there. Oh, I see. We already have 13 people. Um, we can take your questions at any time. Hi, there's a whole bunch of people on that are watching. 13 already. We can take your questions at any time. We are ending really a hard stop around 6.15 because I have to get a, a train and Dr. G has family in town, but we're going to make this 45 minutes count. I see a lot of you are already on. Please start your questions now. Um, we're ready to answer. You can see and hear us both. Thank you, Kay. Hi, Eli, Andrea, James, Donna, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Scott. Dr. G and I are here waving to you. <laughs> um, and so just, you know, start your questions right away. Um, I know Jody, um, our board, one of our board members is going to get on and ask you a question. So I hope she comes on. Maybe, Scott, you can text her and let her know we're ending early. So, um, yeah, hi. hi. Oh, Scott said hi. I see. I'll see you Wednesday. Thank you both. Um, great. So let's get your questions coming in. Oh. So great, thank you, Sarah, you're our first one. My son is six weeks old with a port wine stain from his left chest, foul to his two fingers. Um, okay, I don't see your questions. <laughs> you have to send those questions, Sarah. Um, oh, okay, you're only seeing us. You're, okay, so come back, Sarah, we'll answer your questions. Oh, oh, you're writing, okay. Liv says her daughter Georgia is three months old, has a port wine on her chin, her cheek, and her neck. She's being treated with the Prima and is getting bruising on her cheek, but not on her chin or neck. Should we be seeing the bruising over the whole mark? The laser settings are 12 mil um, and level 7. So uh, bruising is something that we do like to see typically. Uh, in treating birthmarks of this type, the port wine birthmarks. However, uh, with the newborns and the, the young infants, uh, we don't always see the bruising or the purpura. So it's something that, for whatever reason, and the reasons are not clear, uh, we do not see significant bruising, sometimes no bruising at all, uh, when we're treating in the first few months of life. Uh, this is something that we use to our advantage, actually, actually, which we can get into. Uh, but I wouldn't be concerned that there's no bruising early on. If you get to four or five months of age and there's no bruising, then I would reevaluate, you know, where things are going. But there are different parameters. There are different, different choices with the laser treatments uh, that your physician can use. And, and these differences do make a very, very significant uh, impact on the ultimate outcome. So uh, it's possible that the, the treatment is too conservative, but it's also very possible the child's just too young to develop the bruising or purple. Yeah, I guess she just keeps track of the clearance, and that's the best way, That's right? the best way, yep. uh, but it, it, there are also different parameters, so there are different ways to treat, and um, hopefully you're with an experienced physician who, you know, understands those differences, but uh, I, it may be just simply the fact that the child's too young to develop the purple. Well, she is being treated with a Prima, and not many people have one of those. Well, uh, so. you know, that it can be a great device, and uh, there are lots of advantages to the Prima, which we'll be seeing more of, you know, in the, the not-so-distant future, uh, as I do think the ability to use the larger spot size that the Prima has uh, as, as well as the the, the uh, Derma V, 
uh, which has a large spot size as well, uh, provides some significant benefit. I think the larger spot size allows for better penetration of the laser beam. Also, when you're treating children, uh, allows for a faster treatment because you're able to cover the surface area much more rapidly. Good. Um, Andrea wants to know, I have a newborn with a port wine on in his face, in the face. How early do you recommend treatment? <laughs> uh, the sooner the better. So like from the hospital. <laughs> so, uh, you know, out of the, from the nursery to the office, you know, you need to have a physician who's willing to do that and has experience in doing that. But we have found, excuse me, that there is a window of opportunity uh, when the kids are very, very young. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a new protocol where we're using uh, the uh, Prima with the larger spot size with the newborns and treating them on a weekly basis. Now this is a new concept, not a, a lot of physicians are aware of it, uh, but we have been really quite surprised and, and quite overwhelmed with the, the benefit that we're seeing when we treat these young babies early and frequently and also with a larger spot size. Thank you. Um, Suzanne has an interesting question. So she's an adult. She wants to know what you would recommend for an older adult who's had limited treatments, but she has blebs. She wants to know if you can give a local dermatologist guidelines because she can't afford to travel okay. to the free treatments and stuff like well, that. Well, you know, I would contact the DBF. Maybe there's somebody experienced in your area. Uh, so, you know, giving guidelines is a hard thing to do. I mean, there's some general guidelines for sure. But ultimately, it comes down to what's happening at game time during the procedure. You have to be able to identify, you know, how your skin is responding to the treatment. You know, every device is different. For example, we have multiple V-beams in this office. And, you know, I know some run differently than others. So you have to know your machine, and you have to look and see how the, what's responding to the patient, how the patient's responding to the treatment. Because uh, you may have... A particular situation where the treatment is more aggressive or lighter than you might anticipate so you may need to make a game time decision so to determine whether you need to make adjustments in the treatments. Um, also yeah. just as the president of the VBF I'll, I'll you know uh, further support Dr. G we do have laser experts listed so go to our website at birthmark.org go up to find a physician and we list under them by your state or country what they treat. We do not ever, ever recommend having one of our experts just write settings and things down on a piece of paper because that's, that's not a good thing. If they have not, do not have experience in treating with that device, we will not recommend because that puts us at liability if we're recommending and just handing these out to people who do not know how to treat. That's why we just worked on this laser guidelines project with all the top experts was to get some uniform standards. So we do offer free and we do have lists of doctors all over and if it's a, a money thing you can contact me and I can see if I can negotiate with an expert that's close to you. So I'm willing to do that. Um, Jody Lee says my eight-year-old daughter is having more lip growth over the past year and I'm getting concerned. That's Megana. Do you recommend laser on her lip for this? Wait and see, question mark. Any thoughts on preventing growth with bleomycin? Is debulking the best method? At what point does this decision have to be made? So this is a very challenging question. And uh, Linda and I were actually just talking about this very issue uh, before we uh, got on this uh, Facebook uh, event. And the, the truth of the matter is we don't know the answer to that question. However, one thing we do know is that laser treatment generally does not prevent the lip from growing. So, you know, we're trying different things. We're trying radio frequency with microneedling in combination with lasers to see if that might make a difference for the lip. Uh, but we haven't found a real answer for that yet. I would think at this age, uh, being in the hands of an expert who does both injections or at least is aware of injections of gliomycin as well as has knowledge of the surgery is worthwhile. And so yeah. uh, I think to be followed uh, by an expert uh, is absolutely critical for this type of thing. Yeah, it should be seeing Dr. Coletti at the conference okay, great, this year. Okay, great, So he he's certainly one, one of the experts in the world on this yeah. uh, and uh, will be able to 
provide an opinion as to what the best method of management would be. Andrea de la Prieda wants to know who you recommend in Latin America. <laughs> That's a big uh, geographic area. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure, uh, but we can certainly look into that and get back to you. Well, and you can go to the VBF website. We do have a couple of doctors. That, again, you know, where, where are you talking about in Latin America? Um, but go ahead and check out birthmark.org and put your country in and um, see what's around. If you don't find anything, you can email me at vbfpresident at gmail.com. Um, Alexis is saying, my son is three, three now, three years old, with a port wine stain over most of his legs and lower arm. He was treated with the Prima as a newborn. That's interesting. He's three, so that was three years ago, with the larger spot size, but the legs are still very bad. Wondering if there's been any laser or advancements for the extremities. So anything below the elbows and below the knees uh, is particularly challenging. So, you know, the, you know, we get, we've gotten much more aggressive with this newer technique that we have where we're treating them so frequently, which I think is helping. Uh, and we do get some results where we're able to make significant differences. But there are those patients where it just doesn't work and it's much more likely uh, to be challenging below the elbows and below the knees. So the elbows to the fingertips, uh, below the knees to the toes. So, so, I mean, while that area is difficult, also the technician and the device can play a role. Yes, but even with the best physician, the and best operator, and the best technology, you know, you can't always get significant clearing or even uh, noticeable clearing. Not today, but hopefully. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, look, there are things that we're doing now that are making all of this much better, including that the early intervention and the frequent intervention when the kids are tiny, tiny, you know, as newborns. Uh, but I think that at some point on the, on the lower extremities, below the knees uh, in particular, I think one has to accept the fact that one can just lighten the birthmark and not remove it. Good answer. Tiffany, oh, I'm so great, glad she asked this. When treating a port wine in the area between the eyebrow and the eyelid, does the patient need an eye shield? Our 16-month-old is having laser on his port wine without GA, and that area hasn't been treated. His port wine stain doesn't extend onto the eyelid. Okay, so uh, if it does not extend onto the eyelid, you don't need a shield that we place under the eyelids. So we do use these protective shields when we're treating the eyelids themselves. Uh, you can get by with protective goggles, uh, and there are different ways to protect the eye as well, including to, we use tons of gauze to, with somebody's hand over it so it remains in place. So, you know, so I think some eye protection is required, uh, but if it's not on the eyelids, then you don't necessarily need a shield underneath the eyelids themselves. Um, Megan Elizabeth Curley says hello. <laughs> <laughs> I know you see her a lot. She's doing great. One of my superstars. Superstars, uh, yeah. right. Oh, this is a long one. Sarah's question, Sarah Walters Boim. My questions are, we started treatment at 10 days and then five weeks and then have our third next week without GA at Children's National. We plan to stop after this and wait until GA at either six months or one year. His clearance has been good. How will I know how fast the stain grows by, go, grows back? Is everyone staying different? How many treatments do you see with the arm until you see the best clearance? I'm hoping to do annual or one to two a year to keep his stain clear. When we take a break, is that when we know how fast it will grow back? Also, do you have any recommendations of creams you feel to help with lightening? Do you feel there'll be research for creams for lightening? Uh, so let's go back to these questions. There are a number of questions right. you know, here. Um, so but in terms of creams, there is some debate about this. Some people have used serolimus in conjunction with laser. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's debatable. Uh, some people like it. I have not seen significant benefit from it myself. It, cause, it can cause a lot of irritation. Uh, some patients do get eczema or, or dermatitis on their birthmark, which is not uncommon in birthmarks themselves and certainly in birthmarks that are being treated. So creams could be helpful in controlling the eczema. And what were the other questions again? Um, how do you know how many treatments and then to, to do before maintenance? And is maintenance one or two treatments a year? Well, the more clearing one gets, the less likely maintenance will be even be required. 
So, I mean, there are cases where we do get 100% clearing, and those patients generally do not need maintenance. But if you just get a minimal amount of clearing, uh, then or lightening, then more maintenance would be required. Uh, it depends on the patient, the degree of redness or thickness. So it may be once or twice a year, once you're into the maintenance mode. Uh, sometimes people do more than that. And uh, it's just continually evolving. We get a new laser, it gets right. changes to treatments. Again, yeah. uh, newer lasers, newer techniques, newer protocols, these things are also often very, very helpful. Um, and so. also, Alexis, if it's not KTS, that's great news. So possibly it's just a port wine stain, and you know maybe that'll help. that helps. That helps. That helps a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, Megan Elizabeth Curley would like to know why do you think I need to have my lip work on worked on again? <laughs> Megan, be grateful for the benefit that you've received. <laughs> you, look, you look amazing. Yeah, it's uh, great. Uh, you know, the, the, some of these birthmarks, the port wine birthmarks, are deeper. Um, and one of the, the, the issues is that you can't always get to the depth, you know, with the lasers uh, and with the surgical treatments. So, you know, when you have these deeper birthmarks that involve the inside of the mouth, uh, some of them are just much more extensive and cannot be completely cured. Um, this is interesting. I don't know if Liv McGregor's um, child or daughter is your patient, but I think she just said, how long does it take to see the full effect of each laser treatment? We are doing two weekly treatments for our daughter's port wine stain and wondering how we will know when to stop treating. Do you know anybody doing two weekly treatments? Twice a week? Yeah. Or every other week? I don't know. She says, no. we are doing two weekly treatments. Okay. I never heard of that. So, uh, what I'd like to do is take advantage of that window of opportunity. You know, when the kids are very small, mm -hmm. uh, the surface area is small, the skin is thinner, uh, there's what we call fetal hemoglobin from the mother that's uh, very high with the newborns. For whatever reason, uh, these, these young babies do very, very well. Uh, so we'd like to take advantage and treat through it. You know, when you're treating very young, you can see the clearing right away because they don't get the bruising. As they get older and they're starting to bruise uh, with the purpura, uh, then it's harder to see the benefit. So at some point, uh, usually in my practice, when they get to about a year, we take a break. We, we simply stop treatment and reassess. We allow things to heal, we allow things to settle down. Uh, so periodic therapeutic breaks or treatment breaks, I think are helpful to reassess. Agreed. Um, Lauren says, hello from Lima, Peru. My daughter has a hemangioma on her forehead. When she was three years old, she received a laser, but it didn't work. We decided to stop. Any other option and only wait to disappear on its own? Do you recommend laser now that she is six? I guess you'd have to see it. Yeah, you have to see it. And, you know, hemangiomas are different. You have superficial hemangiomas. You have mixed hemangiomas that are superficial and deep, and you have hemangiomas that are deep. Uh, and, and not superficial. So, uh, you know, laser plays a role uh, for those that are superficial and sometimes the mixed ones that are superficial and deep. But we often do combined therapy. And some patients might need uh, propranolol. Uh, other patients may need uh, surgery, depending upon the, uh, the situation. So there are lots of different options, and without seeing it, it's, it's really hard to make that assessment. Like the topical, too, the timolol with the timolol, laser. You know, a timolol with laser for those that are superficial. Uh, I don't think timolol does much for those no, that are not thicker a, not a or, or deeper yeah. below the skin surface. Yeah. Again, you'd have to see it and realize that a laser only penetrates like two... Just a millimeter. Just yeah. a millimeter. Yeah, and so if the bulk is more, you might get a little color out, but that bulk is still there. Right? That's true. Yeah. Um, Brooke, good question. Can you treat the eyebrow? <laughs> so you have to be very cautious with the eyebrow. We're doing a, a, a new study right now. We're looking at eyebrow treatments uh, much more conservatively. Uh, if you treat the eyebrow the way you treat everything else, you're going to end up with loss of hair, particularly in the, in the young children, and even with some adults as well. For whatever reason, even though this laser is not a laser hair removal device, you know, there are different lasers for that purpose. 
the hair follicles, particularly in the children, tend to be much more susceptible to laser light, so we've backed off. But what's happened is we've had so much clearing on the face, uh, we have a lot of people walking around, a lot of kids walking around right now with clear faces and red eyebrows. So, I mean, that looks you know, problematic, you know, and many families think that's problematic. So we have a newer technique that we've been using on the brow, which seems to be safer, uh, just using a lower energy and not being as aggressive. At least and we still able, we're able to blend in much more effectively. So we're, uh, uh, this is something newer that we're doing. Uh, it looks like it's going to be very favorable. And we talked about this in Greece, about even maybe getting some kind of a gel or something with a pigment that could you could put on the hair and then the laser would bypass it. Like well, we do uh, use a gel uh, all the time. Right. You know, we do it on eyelashes and eyebrows just to avoid uh, any burning of the hair. Uh, and you don't, you, know, you don't want anything that's going to be flammable, that's for sure. So we do protect the hair. True. So we've been just cutting back using a little protective gel. And, you know, stay tuned. Yeah, <laughs> stay tuned. Um, Kaylin says, thank you both for putting on this session. Our daughter is 10 weeks old, has a port wine on the right side of her face. We are able to have month monthly pulse dye laser treatments at GOSH here in London. Our question is, can we take a summer vacation? If so, what precautions do we need to take? Well, my general feeling about uh, patients with vascular birthmarks is you want to encourage normal life. You want to treat them as though they're not different. And you don't want to sacrifice normal activities. So take your vacation and, and work around it. You don't want your child's treatments to consume the entire family and the family dynamics. So I think when we're treating the early babies, we do want this uh, repetitive treatments in, in, in short intervals. Uh, it is something that we would like to prioritize, but you know it's also important to have uh, your normal activities and, and a normal your normal function in the family. Yes, and make that your make your child feel normal. Yeah, and just the hat and the sunscreen right. and no direct light, yeah, especially exactly. following laser. And especially if uh, your child is a, has darker skin, it's, it's it's even more important. So if you look like Linda, mm -hmm. you know it's much less of an issue. <laughs> But, you know, if you're Hispanic, Asian, uh, black, uh, the, the impact of sun is, is much more critical. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah says, for newborns, you have treated on the arm that have had spots with very great clearance. Is this a sign that is not as deep and that maintenance will not be as many? Yeah, I think when you do see great clearance, maintenance is much less likely to be necessary. That's for sure. Um, Andrea wants to know, is there any risk for a newborn with treatment? What kind of anesthesia would you use on a newborn? So this is an important question. Uh, we don't use any anesthesia. With that said, the laser still has a cooling device which takes a lot of the pain away. So it protects the skin and takes a lot of the pain away. So <clears throat> not completely, but it's not as though you're treating with it with nothing. So uh, there's a big debate in the um, medical community about anesthesia in children. I'm of the belief it's not necessary. I'm also of the belief that, that you don't want to expose your child uh, to general anesthesia um, with, when multiple procedures are required. As a matter of fact, in the US, uh, the FDA has a warning about repetitive exposures to anesthesia uh, under the age of three. So in our practice, we gen generally, and there are exceptions, uh, do not offer anesthesia to children under three, especially when multiple procedures are required, which is typically the case when you're treating a vascular birthmark. And this next question is similar, but she wants to know, do you ever offer general anesthesia at your practice or with you, with you and what are your thoughts on it? So uh, our practice does offer general anesthesia at uh, the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. Uh, those procedures are performed by my associate, Dr. Leonard Bernstein, who's quite good. Yeah, he's been doing this a long time he's as well. Doing this a long time. Um, we are using Amatop numbing cream on our three-month-old for treatment of the port wine. Our doctor has said new studies have found numbing cream doesn't affect the outcome of the laser, but we have noticed that her birthmark does fade a lot with the numbing cream. Should we be worried this is affecting the treatment? 
So there are a couple of issues in this question. Um, one, uh, I do not believe that the numbing cream impacts outcomes, and we did this study and published it many years ago. So I'm quite confident about that. Uh, the other question is, what, is, what are the issues in applying a topical numbing cream to a young baby? And it all comes down to surface area and the comfort level uh, of the physician applying the cream. You can get absorption in the body uh, in larger amounts when the skin is very young and thin. So we're very cautious about that. Typically, we do not uh, apply a topical anesthetic before the age of one. And we also calculate how much we can deliver to the skin because you don't want to get too high a level in the body. So I have some concerns about that, to be frank. Um, so, and, and you don't even use it at all before, w what age is it where you want uh, to Not before it? one. Not before one. Right. Yeah. I mean, because the body is so small and it still has a systemic effect. And some, yes, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, and these treatments are often so quick. Yeah. So mo many of the parents don't even want to wait the time. Right. Uh, you, you have to look at that when the, your average treatments with these newborns can be under 60 seconds. You know, what are you putting them through for that? And the best part about the done in one weeks are, is they're never going to remember that because you're, 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 they're done in a few months. That's true. When they're only three, That's four true. months old. And the other point about little kids and the topical anesthetic is they wipe it off. <laughs> so, you know, it's yeah. not as though they're going to lie there still and the cream stays on the skin. It, it disappears. Um, yeah. This is a great question. Lois is 62 and she's had five treatments in the 80s, which she said didn't do much, but of course back then. Um, so she stopped. She wants to know, is it too late to do anything now? And will it prevent more hypertrophy or blebs later if she does it now? Yes. No, it's not too late to do it now. I mean, I've done, my oldest patient was 90. Uh, and yes, I do believe that you can minimize the blebs by treating so I, I would recommend it just for that very purpose, even if it's not cosmetic. Um, so Angie, again, the woman from Peru just is asking basically what type of lasers you use so she can look for somebody there. So uh, we use a, a combination of things. Most commonly we use the, the V-beam, which we've used historically over the years, both the V-beam and the V-beam Prima. Uh, I use the XLV or the Derma-V for the, the bumps, the blebs. And the Derma V we use, you know, for regular birthmarks as well. Great. Um, Brooke had another question, and she's from Australia, and she's saying they won't do treatments over one year old without anesthesia, um, but she wants it done without anesthesia, and she wants to know, it can it be done without anesthesia after age one? Absolutely, absolutely. So a lot depends on the size of the birthmark, the comfort level of the physician comfort level of the team assisting the physician because you can't do it by yourself. You need a team when you're treating kids. So, you know, some of these birthmarks are very small. And, you know, we, we can do even large areas uh, quite successfully without general anesthesia. And we're still talking about little people, you know, so even a significant size is doable in a yeah, short I mean, period of time. Just think about how much smaller your child is now compared to what he or she will be. Right. So it's, it's more manageable size in terms of the treatment. Yeah, uh, uh, a half of a face on a newborn is this size. A half of a face on a five-year-old is like this size. Right, so and as you get older, you know, the larger it gets. Right. So. Um, so, so Tiffany Hanna wants to know, how do you treat a two- to three-year-old if you're not using GA? They tend to be bigger, stronger, and understand more what's going on. That's a good question. Uh, you know, the psychologist associated with... Uh, BBF Leslie Graff has done a great job in, in uh, providing some guidance. I believe Linda is not posted on your website. Yes, it is, and it's so, the Laser Guidelines booklet. And right. we're doing another booklet on all the things that the parents can do for comforting pre and post right. laser. Right. But we do have some information, and and it's helpful. So we're able to, you know, work our way through it with these treatments for uh, children who are two or three. Uh, granted, we do have a larger spot sized laser which makes it much faster much easier you know in treating these kids um, but you know they get through it uh, again you're using a dynamic cooling spray which is acts as an anesthetic itself so you're not totally treating without anything 
So you're, that you are providing some uh, anesthetic relief uh, without going through general anesthesia. And because well, we're topical over a large area. Sorry, and yeah. um, because we only have 15 more minutes, this has been going so fast. Um, we are when the newer the new lasers that's supposed to be coming out will be the bigger spot size, and you know all the technology will be the best of the best. And just for people to understand translationally, when you go from a standard pulse die spot size to the bigger one, the 12 or the 15. You're literally cutting those zaps almost in half. Right. So, again, uh, one of the advantages of one of the many advantages of the the newer devices is the higher energy, uh, the larger spot. Mm -hmm. So the combination of the two uh, does allow for better clearing and a much more comfortable treatment, and does allow us to get through these treatments with these uh, patients who aren't happy to be there. You know, at the age of two on up. Um, and getting through it much more quickly. So I'm much more, we do offer the general anesthesia and we do it when it's necessary, not before the age of three, uh, based on the FDA guidelines right now, um, but we try to avoid it whenever it's possible. Um, so Liv says there's two laser depths on the Prima. My three month old is just having treatment with the 595. When is it safe to use both? Well, there are two wavelengths on the Prima, depending on which device you have, 595 and 1064. So I, they, I, they're just using the PDL part, not right, the Right, right. I do not recommend the 1064 in children, unless it's something that's a little bit thicker and you can absorb the heat safely and effectively. So the, the first uh, mantra, the, the, the first uh, thought and uh, the first guideline is to first do no harm. And, you know, the one of the wavelengths, the 1064 laser, uh, is a little bit risky in children. So we try to stay away from that unless we're dealing with something very, very thick that can absorb that e extra heat. Um, Andy has a long one. My daughter, who is seven, had darkening of her facial port wine following a severe rash and strep throat. Her birthmark had previously lightened significantly after many PDLs. It's been three months since she had the strep and her birthmark is almost back to baseline. Do you recommend more laser treatments or should we wait? That's very interesting. You know, I do see that periodically, so I'm not totally surprised. It's a very rare thing, um, but I, I'm not sure why this happens, but I have seen it. Uh, first of all, you want to make sure there's nothing else going on. So I pay, some patients will call me up and say, hey, you know, my birthmarks, my child's birthmark has gotten worse, and they come in and they have the dermatitis, that I, the rash that I talked about earlier. So, you know, things get redder because of that. So that's one thing that has to be considered when you, you hear this story. Uh, the other is there are just some rare instances where things do revert back for some unknown reason. And under those circumstances, we just go to 11. Sarah has an uh, interesting question. She said, are there any patients that you treated on the arms and now you're still treating them as adults and do they maintain good clearance? Well, if they're clear, if we get complete clearance, we don't. It's pretty uncommon to see recurrence. It's possible, but it's much less common. So that's why we strive for that, you know, as much as possible. Uh, if you don't get complete clearance, then you're more likely to require maintenance over the long term. Um, because we only have 11 minutes left, the answer, Jackie, is that they did find a GNAQ mutation for port wine stains. That's what she wanted to know. Right. Is it genetic? It's not genetic, but they found a gene. Now, that's correct. It's not something that's inherited. In right. Words. It's right. a somatic mutation. Right. right. Um, how do you know how deep a port wine stain is? Is it based on clearance from the first treatment? or color of the stain? Uh, well, you know, on the face, one of the things we do is uh, we look inside the mouth, because that'll give you some idea. You know, if you see redness inside the mouth on the gums, if you see it on the inner portion of the cheek, uh, then you have some idea that it's, it's going to be thicker uh, over, over time and mo much more difficult to treat. So it's hard to say. If one sees the thickening of the lip, uh, as an example, or the enlarged ear is an example, then one would have a pretty certain assessment that this is a deeper process. 
Um, hi, John. So John Berger, you've treated him before. He was a former VP of VBF years Remember, ago, yes. the attorney. He want, He's coming in October. He's very big into biking, mo motorized and non-motorized, competitive, long distance, having a great life retiring. But he does have some thickening, and so he's going to come in October because he'd like to get back to treating. But he has it on his face and his arm. Yeah, no so problem. we yeah. will be able to do both, right? Best we can. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tiffany said, my son has been having PDL on his port wine since eight months old. We need to go up to level 10, 12 setting to see maximum clearance. His port wine is on his face. Oh, do we need to go up to 10, 12 setting to see maximum so, clearance? So uh, when you talk about a 10, 12 setting, I'm assuming that they're using a seven millimeter spot size. Uh, my personal preference is to not do that. You know, I like the larger spot size. I'd rather see you push the envelope a bit on 10 or even 12 millimeters, which is part of the VD Perfecta. So uh, there seems to be a group of physicians, particularly amongst the pediatric dermatology community, that likes that small spot size. But I really do feel that the larger spot size provides more benefit and it offers a faster, more comfortable treatment for the patient. Um, Sarah would like to know, how do you know when to stop going and to enter into maintenance? Well, when you've done a few treatments uh, consecutively and no further change, that's a, a time to reassess. So when I see that, that's the point at which we often take a break and let things settle down and see where things are at. So Kay said this was an interesting question about it being genetic because they realized they, an uncle and a cousin have it. And that can be, it can be, the GNAQ mutation is common. It's not, you know, so multiple people, especially depending on the size of your family, um, can have it. It's just not genetic in that a mom is going to pass it on to her child. That's or true. a father who has a port wine is going to make his there, baby There's happen. one exception. Uh, there is a midline port wine stain that we sometimes see. Uh, that tends to be autosomal dominant, which means it, it's you do pick it up from a family member. Uh, but it, it's, I, I've seen it quite a few times in my career where the, you know, the mother or father comes in <laughs> with a baby and they have identical birthmarks, and it's always this midline birthmark. And and what he's know. talking about is the angel kiss and the stork bite. You guys, well, I think this is different than an angel the, kiss. I know. The, well, the yeah. midline capillary is what you're talking well, about. Well, there, there's the midline that is the angel's kiss that disappears on its own. Right. And there's also one that does not disappear. And the one that does not disappear is usually that familial one, where you do see it in the parent and the child. Yeah, because so. we I see a lot of them where the father says, "Oh yeah, you can still see mine on the back of my scalp, but I don't cut yeah, my we, hair we, short." Yeah, we leave those alone. Yeah, yeah, we leave. But is that one those. of the ones you're saying that's persistent? No, it's it's, it's simply a, a like a V-shaped midline lesion. Okay. Uh, I I just saw one last week where the, the mother comes in with her child. Can you treat this? And okay. she's got the same thing herself. Wow, this is interesting. Christine Zamiga says her great grandfather has half his body with a port wine. Her niece has half her face, and she has half her right leg. <laughs> you need to have maybe some studies yeah. done. Um, do you ever get clearance on the hand and or fingers? More likely to get clearance on the hand or fingers if you begin during early infancy. So there's a very short window of opportunity. So we're seeing it much more commonly now with this early intervention treatment. Beyond that, if you start later, uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get clearance. And um, we're winding down, and so what I want to make sure I get out there to everybody is that the VBF conference is Columbus weekend, October 6th, 7th, 8th, here in New York City at Dr. G's office. You can register at birthmark.org. We're doing this year free laser, free ultrasound, free eye exam, which is new this year to, to pre-screen for glaucoma in babies, free dental, free hotel and a free consultation and free psychotherapy. That's pretty amazing, wouldn't you say? Well, <laughs> that's a start. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and it's all free. BBF, for, yeah. thank you to all of our laser companies and sponsors who make this possible and donors for all of you. Um, and then live one, one, someone is responding saying, what is the short window of opportunity? Well, I think during early infancy is our best window 
certainly it, you know in the first year of life is a great window um, and if you're logging on to this you're, you're probably not a parent of a newborn because you haven't figured it out yet about the VBF uh, but the the earlier one begins the better the treatments will be and the faster it'll be the easier it'll be and but certainly the most successful um, is there anything else you'd like to add about what's coming down the pike? Drug therapies, je injections, new lasers? Well, so the, the, the Derma-V is a new device, and you know that's helpful because of the large spot size. They also use uh, something called post-cooling. With, with, like we talked earlier in the session about the cooling that's done to, to minimize discomfort. So they cool before and after the laser treatment with the cool spray. And that tends to diminish some of the discomfort. So that's a very positive advance, for sure. And that, is that something anybody could adopt right now? Uh, the manufacturer would have to do that. Okay. And uh, by manufacturer, yeah. you mean the Lutronic device? The Lutronic device. Because they, yeah. they built it into their right, device. Right. Uh, Candela is going to have a next generation device for birthmarks in the next year or so. Yep. So that, that's a big deal. Uh, there's uh, another uh, company called Cyton, which is using something called the BBL uh, with uh, a device called the Hero, and that allows for uh, a faster treatment as well. They're just starting to look at birthmarks uh, in addition to the others. So, uh, you know, there's activity out there. Things are happening. Yep. And I, I'm going to end it with this because I love it. So Jan Winter says, thank you, Dr. G for your services to the VBARS community. It really does change lives. Well, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's a passion, and I'm, I'm glad we're making some real differences for patients. And we'll be back next month. Not sure who our Facebook Live expert will be, but stay tuned, and we'll let you know. Thank you all. You can watch these and every video of Dr. Geronimus and all our experts on our website. We keep them forever. If you want to go back, you can review them all, and you can review this on our Facebook page. Thank you all. Stay safe. God bless. Thank you, Dr. J. Have a good night. Thanks, Linda.